What is up down and sideways, all you beautiful individuals? Welcome back to yet another repeat of the government here at our PRT Beauties. We've been hyping it up. We've been talking about it for, honestly, a full year, I've said before. But really, over a month plus now, we've been highlighting since these Asian Games rosters were revealed. Korea versus China. Semi-final action. Only a best of three, not a best of five. And first and foremost... If you found the games this morning to even watch them, two thumb, kudos <laughs> to you for finding them. The internet sleuths out there finding a way through to find uh, the video for it. Yes, you found the stream. And yes, only a best of three. But I don't think it would have mattered, really, if we move to a best of five the way the performances were on the day. Get it out right away. Team Korea crushing Team China to move on to the gold medal match. And listen, China... They had some great early games in both of them. Uh, and then at the mid-late game, team fighting, surprisingly enough, was much better out of Korea than China in a lot of these matchups. Obviously, Ruler's the main guy to highlight. He continues to have Elk's number in 2023 already, of course, unfortunately. Seeing a lot of, a lot of flame going the way of Elk for this series. But guys, Ruler's done this to everyone on the planet this year. I think there's multiple things to talk about with that situation. And one of them is realizing that this is Elk stepping up to take over this role when it should have gone to someone more so like Jackie Love, who is skipping the event type of thing. Or even in the conversation, yes, I understand there's people that want Gala there as that option. You got to remember when they're deciding these rosters and everything's kind of finalizing out and, and you know, securing it. Gala hadn't been on that stretch that he was with, with LNG to close out the year, that type of form. So it makes sense that Elk was there. And then, yes, it is that expected result when you do look at how the head-to-head -head between Elk and Ruler has gone this year, even with all the progress that Elk has made, and even with as good as he is, Ruler's a whole different beast. And you really saw that with not only with what Ruler was doing, I think we got to be scared about what Kyria was doing alongside him, on the Alistar. Yeah, I think as most people predicted, the bot lane was the biggest gap in this series, especially when you include Kyria versus Mako, which is even more one-sided than the Elk Ruler matchup. But the surprise matchup in this series was top lane. Bin was supposed to be the big advantage. He's in Zeus's head after their MSI matchup, but it was Zeus getting a solo kill in a pivotal moment in this series, solo killing Bin, immediately TPing to Baron, it's 5v4, and T1, that was the main snowball of that game. This is where you see that type of, you know, uh, game-changing ability that someone like Zeus has and why he is one of these options on that T1 lineup that can carry the way that he can, is the way that he performed in this series and really leveled up against a player like Bin, who has, as you mentioned, in the past, not just against Zeus, but he's had the number of almost all these other guys rolling through from the LCK. Been getting denied this time around by Zeus. And yes, I think the other thing is the way that then he takes that advantage and shares it around and utilizes that pressure, that strength in these other team fights, specifically around the Dragon Pit, I think is where uh, you're looking at the advantage really swing over in favor for Team Korea away from the early game advantages that Team China had secured. That is the big ones for me. Jungle side of things, we know Kanavi has been absolutely terrorizing these first four games. I guess the coaching staff, Koma, said, Kanavi, you're having too much fun. Let's put you on Vi. Let's put you on Sichuani duty. He still looked great. We didn't get any roster changes. I thought whoever went down 0-1 was going to get, you know, Jun subbing in on the side of China, but it was JJ both games. And Kanavi, not as dominant as the first four games, but still a big jungle diffie. And I think that's one of the ones where you're looking at it and maybe saying that there's a mistake in this series, in the preparation for Team China, not realizing that, yes, in the best of three, not in the best of five, you got to be willing to pull your trigger on these type of moves, these type of changes in that series right away. You can't have any, well, you know what? Let's see it. One more game type of thing. One more game, you're out of it, is the way that this type of series works in a best of three. And I think that was part of it. But you're right, just the performance on the side of Kanavi, even having to dial it back a little bit more, be a little bit more self, uh, you know, team serving uh, at this point, playing the vibe, playing that Sejuani, of course, in the second game. 
still finding a way to have that impact and show us Kanavi's going to be in some pretty darn good form heading towards this world championship. We uh, better look back at this event in a couple of months to see if there was some tampering that goes on between T1 <laughs> and Kanavi. Maybe Faker saying, whoa, he looked pretty good on this lineup. Maybe next year you could come back with the old LCK. Uh, that's why Chovy's in the game because Faker's just, he's preparing the whole suite of how to sugar talk your boy Kanavi over to T1. He's got, a, pretty... he's got a direct line into Kanavi's headset while he's playing. Oh, it looks good. I look bitter on a T1. He's, he's, he's like, whoa, this is the this is the faker experience where he takes control of that thing. Uh, it'd be really funny to, uh, fun to see that type of thing come through. But yes, overall, right here was a very controlled, very commanding victory by Team Korea to set them on this path towards the gold medal match. And as you mentioned, Faker didn't play. It was Chobi both games. Faker's only played that one uh, Yone game at this entire event. And for a guy who's so famous, you've seen these videos of him arriving at the airport, just being around this entire event, he's only played one game. And that's like kind of the awesome thing, I think, from a League of Legends fan's perspective and seeing this coverage of the Asian games is seeing that, you know, you, you watch the normal Olympics and, and you know the professional athletes end up showing up. Everybody wants to pick with LeBron James. Everybody wants to pick with Usain Bolt. Asian games, everybody wants to pick with your boy Faker, the unkillable demon king, the number one commodity at this event. Great to see him get this type of, you know, celebrity status, a little bit of extra attention, of course, from the rest of the world. And again, it's it's not just esports players. It's it's the full traditional sports athletes that are like, man, this guy's so famous. Even I know about him. That, again, just speaks to the level of esports interest in these Asian countries compared to what we have here in North America. Uh, so overall, should we be disappointed? I know the Chinese uh, scene is gonna flame these guys to no end, but it, it, is it worthwhile to be flamed? Do they deserve it? No, I, I don't think that it, it's, it's a flame type of territory situation. I think it is absolutely a place where you can be a little disappointed in the way that the, the, the performance played out on the Rift. I think you can talk about whether you had the full commitment from your national players to figure out and line up this lineup and have the priority for this and all these other type of things. That's a different type of conversation. But I think at the end of the day, you do look at the way that this played out. I think it was overwhelming from Korea, the way that they came through and the way that they were able to take control and command of this game anywhere outside of the first 10 minutes. It did. Maybe it's just because I was seeing more footage from the side uh, of the Korean esports side of things, but it, it honestly seemed like they were pouring in more resources, taking it even more seriously. Again, I haven't seen any or much behind the scenes for the team trying to think, but Korea was all in and listen, let's be, let's be honest. It's not over yet. Despite what we might think, they haven't won the gold medal. There still is a whole other round. There was another side of the semifinal bracket, which was also a pretty hype matchup on paper. Taiwan versus Vietnam. Chinese Taipei, though, they, they were all business. And after Vietnam had dominated some 16-minute games in the quarterfinals, it was sub-60 minutes, both sub-30-minute wins uh, for Chinese Taipei. Fofo looking great on a pair of Tristana games, and they were all business. Karfa, Karsa laughing the whole way through. Oh, baby, this is scary. This is where it gets serious here for Team Korea is that knowing that you are facing down this gold medal matchup against what will be Chinese Taipei. And of course, the way that they played through that series against Vietnam. Yes, this is the one where it's warming up just enough where you got to have them on the radar. You got to be scared enough if you're Team Korea that this is still a lineup that packs that firepower, packs that pedigree. That is enough to be the ones that can take you down. These are players looking at Chinese Taipei, looking at someone like Karsa that has made a career of being the Korean killers, the dream crushers at Worlds. A, an opportunity at the Asian Games, you better believe your boy Karsa ain't going to be missing that one. Karsa and Sword Art carrying the spirit of Flash Wolves, which, yeah, countless times at MSI and at Worlds, they were the ones handing often the only defeat to an LCK squad at these international events. So, you know, maybe carrying a little bit of that over. Obviously, they are still going to be absolutely massive underdogs against Korea, but I mean, it didn't take as much as I thought it would be against the LPL. So you feel like Korea 
very locked in, laser focused on what the end goal is, which is, of course, a gold medal. And they're already sitting pretty with minimum silver, our Chinese Taipei. But uh, I, I wouldn't be shocked still if they somehow managed to take a game. I wouldn't be shocked. I think they can make it interesting. I think the problem is going to be, for me, I'm looking at that top side. I'm looking at the way that Zeus was able to crush someone like Ben and level up. And that focus, that attention that he's got right now, you know, there's no way someone like Hanabi is going to be able to level up and stand in that type of way, neutralize, keep him around, all those type of things. Zeus is going to be a threat. He's going to be someone you got to deal with. The question is, you got any answers on the side of Chinese Taipei? Because number one, Hanabi's not going to be that answer. You have the answer. Are you picking up the advantages? Are you finding those things where you can contest it from the other parts of your team? And that's where it gets even harder because then you're stacking up Trovi. Then you're stacking up Ruler. Then you're stacking Kiria, Kanavi. What option do you want where you're saying, yeah, we're getting something from there where we're going to be able to counteract? Yeah, the problem is the solo lanes are really, you know, Hanabi obviously going... Uh, to represent at Worlds, and then Fofo had a very solid year on EDG. But you look at Carsa and Doggo. These are guys on the outs of kind of being starting level guys in the LPL. Uh, uh, Doggo's gone back over to the PCS now as well. But Carsa, we were so low on after his last time on Weibo, and when he was subbed out for Weiwei, that's kind of where they ascended. And uh, having him match up against the current form Kanavi is in is going to be a recipe for some painful early games. Yeah, it's it it's, could be a bloodbath is the thing. I think we're being cautious and being respectful enough to say that there is that chance, that there is that upset percentage. It's there. You do need to be serious and focused enough that you're paying that that respect. At the same time, if you're paying that respect, if you're focused in, well, the results should be so much so in the favor of Team Korea that it shouldn't even be that actual concern. China's getting flamed for getting 2 0 It's going to be infinitely worse if they somehow lose that third place match against Vietnam. Four bronze, much like the Korea Chinese Taipei. They're going to be huge, maybe even bigger favorites after Vietnam just got uh, completely dumpstered. The question is, it seems ridiculous to say, are they still motivated? But they lost the big match. I'm sure they'll still be looking for redemption to close things out. And again, this team is so talented, all it takes is going through the motions for them to be lethal. Yeah, you, you got to find a way to fire it up for this matchup. I know it's a thing that is looked at, not just in esports, of course, is the conversation around this bronze medal match, all these type of things. And when you have aspirations for that gold medal, and you know that's the only ticket, that's the one that matters, you can get into these territories where you have these conversations and you find yourself lacking when you need to, and you go home with an even worse result than is necessary. Swallow some pride, realize the situation, and take what you can in front of you. You got to focus for this bronze medal game. As you said, even with minimal level of focus, the expectation should be that Team China has enough firepower to take this one through. And I know all the highlights are very hard to find, but if you haven't seen some of the opening ceremony stuff they had for this event, by the way, you know, we know these... Uh, whether it's the Olympics, esports events, all the technology, especially in China and uh, South Korea, that they use for these events are absolutely insane. And this one was absolutely no exception. Pageantry dialed up to 11 for these ones. Make sure you were seeing if you want. You that. had to wait an extra year for this one. They had to go big. If you want to see what it can kind of look like if we were ever to have an actual League of Legends World Cup international type of event thing, Watch these type of things. Watch how the presentation goes through and think that's just what we could have. That is just the first bite of the apple of what could be that international event for Worlds. And again, remember any of the meta, tiny meta that you're seeing at this Asian Games, it ain't coming over to Worlds because we are seven patches ago in these games. That's the real reason probably Faker's not starting. He I'm says, not practicing in that now. Nah. You handle this one, Trovi. I can do some, you know, behind the scenes. I can do some controlling type of work back here and see and feed you guys the information. I ain't playing this patch. Nah, I'm not, I'm not going back to that LeBlanc-filled uh, <laughs> meta, all this static shift stuff. We've, we've progressed too far as a meta to be going back to that. Little off-rift news. LEC 
format change in 2023. The league continues to develop. Now, Riot announcing that for 2024, there will be a salary cap being implemented over to the LEC. And Mark, imagine making a sweeping lead league-wide change actually in between seasons. What, what a genius idea. Oh, well, couldn't couldn't be the LCS, right? Good. It's got to be the LEC coming through with something like this. And I think that this is one where it's going to take a little bit more time to digest and understand and obviously then see the fallout and how, how it impacts the scene. But right now, I think conservatively feeling pretty positive about this being implemented in the LEC and especially thankful that it's this timing that we are getting with this type of announcement, this type of introduction, because I think any earlier could have had a pretty dramatic response for the European scene. I think right now it's about as healthy as possible where you could introduce something like this and hope to see those positive effects for the scene. So if you're at all familiar with uh, a lot of the traditional sports, again, at least here in North America, it's essentially a luxury tax where whatever, let's say a million dollars, if you spend more than a million dollars, 50% of that is going to be put back into this pool, which isn't going directly to Riot, which we'll get to in a minute. And then if you're spending 150% more of that, then you're paying the full lump sum that you go over, which we've seen with NBA and NFL teams. They say, who cares? We have so much money. We'll pay the tax. We want to have the best team. We know the esports ecosystem isn't exactly in a uh, space where people are spending a whole lot of money for their organization. So I'm not so sure that that's gonna be an issue. But uh, the big part here for me is, number one, the excess money, Riot isn't just pocketing. It's gonna go divided amongst the other LEC teams that are staying under that threshold. And as well, some of it going to develop the second tier leagues, the uh, regional leagues, the ERLs, which is absolutely fantastic. And I'm impressed they're doing that. Yeah, I think that that is the really kind of one of the sweetest cherries when you're looking at this situation is that that is where the money is going to be going through. I think there's a lot of things to talk about with what these thresholds and floors are, what these numbers actually equal out to, what that means for players contracts and things like that, which again, you, you know, everyone knows we're all in favor of people getting paid to play video games. We love that stuff over here and especially when you got the skills and the personalities to make yourself even more attractive in that type of way but understanding that you gotta have some type of control over where these salaries are going and where these finances are knowing how things played out in the lcs i have that feeling that this is a good safety measure and a good timing of the safety measure in the lec and then as you mentioned where that money is going it's not just being pocketed by you know riot games you know just like they do with all the skins or whatever this is different this is where this money is going to go into that pool where 50 percent is going to the teams that are at that floor in the lec and then 50 percent reinvested into those minor regions the second tier of esports in the in the european regions i think that it's a pretty much a slam dunk in that type of regard of course i think this will, you know, scale back that higher end. Um, the expectation is hopefully lifting up that floor a little bit for some of these players to equal it out. And seeing how this plays out, I think, is going to be one of the most ex interesting and exciting things to come through in 2024 for the LEC. And this report specifically says multiple times, it talks about your team's five highest paid players is what this uh, threshold is going to affect. So... I mean, to me, that means if you have a six or seven team roster, your two subs, that salary is not going to be going against that salary cap. So it's still encouraging, uh, you know, a six or seven player rotation if you wanted it. And that floor you mentioned, you can't just go with a salary of gold players that you're paying five grand each. You still have to meet a bottom. I think it's the whatever, 50% of what uh, that total is. So that's good that you're not going to have teams just completely selling off. Not sure that that would be an issue. But you mentioned it being good timing, and that's because the LEC budget, or excuse me, the LCS budget is so out the window. I don't think these European teams need to worry as much about their star players going over to the LCS for a huge paycheck because they ain't giving out big paychecks right now. Oh, sir, there's been so much turmoil. There's been so much change happen in the LCS, and especially with the fluctuation of how these contracts have gone, how much the salaries have risen up. You know, uh, a 
paying Sword Art, the amount that TSM did, paying Perks, the amount that C9 did, obviously with, still with different results in between them, but those are still astronomical numbers. And of course, yes, love players getting all this money, get as much bag as you can for playing video games, all these things. But when you do have the conversation about what that does, how that plays out for the you know health of the ecosystem for this league, it had bad effects for the LCS. I think that is undeniable. And when you're wanting to protect yourself from that type of path, that type of trajectory, and if you're the LEC, I think that this is very much the right precautionary steps to do so. I think this is just another step in the direction of us seeing the LCS start saying, okay, those guys are too expensive. That import's too expensive. Well, Berserker worked out really well for Cloud9. Let's check out the challenger pool over in the LCK so we can sign some of these guys over for peanuts and maybe they'll become MVP of the league. Well, let's just hope that a couple of them haven't forgotten where you found old Jojo Pyun from and dial that type of number where they found Mr. Palafox, where you find Mr. TSM Insanity. Let's dial up some of those numbers. I think, of course, you can talk about all those type of examples in the LEC still too. Now we're going to be implementing the this new salary floor and, and threshold limitations. And listen, a team not in the LEC like Carmine Corp now might be paying guys more than they're making in the LEC. If you're not worried about going to Worlds, maybe you just want a nice payday or a year of that. Teams might legitimately go to the ERL instead of the LEC. Oh, what a perfect situation, man. Just enjoy the LFL scene, the fans. You're going to get your own arena. Like that. And cash in? Oh, boy, that sounds like quite an opportunity. I, I'm sure, again, still does not outweigh the type of prestige that does play in the LEC, that does play into having that opportunity to represent at international events like MSI, like Worlds, of course, is the biggest thing still. Right now, initial expectations of this is, is good for the LEC going to be moving into a new era in multiple leagues though for 2024 but that is it today for league unlock eric and mark here with you beautiful people thanks for watching we will catch you on that flippity flip